wanted to tell you a couple of things first. I've been at uh, CSUN about uh, 16 years. I've been teaching introductory accounting about, about 29. And so I think I know the stuff. And uh, this is what I should talk to you about. But I'll take questions, no problem. Uh, I'm teaching introductory accounting. Hey, students are great. I've had them in my class. They always get A's because they're really dedicated. Uh, and one other thing I wanted to tell you, Professor, and sorry I might not tell you this, but I actually was one of the students. <laughs> Even though I look older now, I actually went to this class. I was a professor at UCLA and I was a PhD student. So isn't that pretty interesting? Okay. Anyway, I uh, suppose you have a list of top ten concepts. I'm going to be talking about virtually all of them, including present value and future value, time value of money, annuities, because apparently that's troublesome to a lot of students. He told me that there were um, some other topics that I should touch upon too, so uh, I'm going to go as fast as I can, but you know, I'll stick around and ask you can interrupt me, whatever. Hopefully I can count what I'm supposed to do. I feel bad that we only have an hour together. Uh, but um, uh, on the exam, you know, that you're going to take, which is multiple choice, they ask about lots of different things. This is just a review. The three basic financial statements are the uh, balance sheet, the income statement, the statement of cash flow. And uh, remember this stuff. Balance sheet reflects the fundamental accounting equation, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders' equity. Does everyone know what assets are? You can name a few. No. Cash. That's yeah. equity. Cash, receivables, yeah. inventory, stuff, prepaid insurance, um, land building equipment, inventory, really good. Supplies, right, okay. Liabilities, examples, accounts payable, salaries payable, interest payable, notes payable, wages payable, taxes payable, if I didn't mention that. Okay, and then, you know, we've got what the owners contributed, which would be um, their permanent investment, which is, if it's corporation common stock, the sole proprietorship is Ronstone Capital, right? And then what they left in the business, that if it's a corporation, it's retained earnings, right? And uh, if it's a sole proprietorship, well, the capital account changes, it gets added to. We do have something called a statement of changes, uh, I'm sorry, a statement of uh, retained earnings or capital, we can do an analysis of capital, I, I, I can go into that. So anyway, this thing shows financial position at a point in time. It's like a snapshot, shows the company's assets at December 31st, or whatever the end of the month, end of the year is. It's a point in time. What are its assets, what are its liabilities, what's left over for the owners? Because after all, assets, let's see here, assets minus liabilities is what's left over for the owners. Anything about balance sheets you want to talk about? I think I know what the questions are, but I don't want to raise it if you're comfortable. No, I can't, because there's so many. I haven't talked the whole semester on, on, on all these topics. All right, well, let me go, keep going in your income statement. Second main financial statement, sometimes called the statement of profit and loss, the PL. Reflects another equation, revenues minus expense equals net income. If expenses are greater than revenue, we have what? Net loss. Okay, some examples of revenue, sales of goods, sales of services, interest income, or interest revenue. Expenses, probably the biggest expense if it's a merchandising company or manufacturing. Cost of goods sold, right? Cost of goods sold. Salaries, expenses, typically very large. What else? Depreciation, utilities, interest expense, tax expense, right? Right. And we're trying to match up with expense to come up with a measure of net income. It reports or shows results of operations during a particular time period. Rather than a snapshot of a point in time, it's sort of like a video. It shows what came in, what went out, and in terms of new asset inflows, sales, asset outflows, I'm talking about paying expenses, shipping out merchandise, it reports the results of operations. <coughs> statement of cash flow is a relatively new statement. I don't know how familiar you are with it or not. Right, you ought to take a look at it uh, if you haven't seen one. I don't have an example, but uh, any recent book talks about the statement of cash flow. This, by the way, is the book that we 
he's in County 220. If you don't have it, I have an extra copy, and someone can borrow it if they want. Um, there's something that's over in the library on financial accounting. Um, there's just come follow me after this hour, and I can give you some others that I have to sit and collect and collect upstairs. But the statement of cash flows also shows for a period of time, okay, what caused cash balances to change from the beginning to the end of the year. And it shows the net increase or decrease in cash. And there's three reasons why cash could change in general, right? We have, I'm going to erase along, I'm going to sort of move it in right here. Just a pine here. We have, uh, first of all, companies borrow money, uh, sell stock, right? Those are called financing activities. They've got to get the cash from someplace. So they have cash from financing activities. I mentioned sale of stock, borrowing long term, okay? issuing debt, notes payable, bonds payable. What do they do with the, what do they do with the money they have? They invest in productive capacity. These are called investing activities. I'm just trying to sort of say, look, look at all the transactions that occur in a company. There's sort of like three general types of activities. So what do they buy? They buy land, they buy building, they buy equipment. Would that provide cash or use cash? Use cash, right. So this is cash inflow, this is cash outflow. Now we've got the productive capacity. Now we're going to start manufacturing or purchasing inventory and incurring expenses related to selling those goods and services. Those are called operating activities. These over here are like long term. You know, issuing stock is borrowing money. You just can't sort of borrow it. You typically don't just issue stock for a day. You issue it for a long period of time. If you borrow, you're short-term borrowing, but there's long-term borrowing. It's typically long-term. It's a sort of a strategic decision that companies make. Then they have to figure out what productive capacity they need, and it's a strategic long-term type decision, right? Long-term. These are more day-to-day. We purchase inventory, or we purchase raw material to make finished goods. We've got the finished goods, we sell it to customers, we either collect cash, we have a receivable, the receivable eventually converts to cash. So if you were looking at a statement of cash flow, and if I were you, I'd go look up an example. You're going to see three separate categories on a statement of cash flow. Cash from or used by operating activities, cash from or used by uh, financing activities and cash used from cash from or used by the last category here investing activities. You could have an inflow, you could have an outflow in each category. For instance, if you issue stock, cash comes in, right? But if you retire stock, cash goes out. So within each category, you're going to see descriptions, and you're going to see Sometimes there's an increase and sometimes there's a decrease. If they, let's say they, they borrowed money from a bank and paid off the loan. When they borrowed it, cash came in. When they paid off the loan, cash went out. Right? So a lot of students think, well, I didn't really learn this or I forgot about it. You just have to know in general, what does it look like? What is its purpose? It does the change in cash? It's a very important statement in that um, you can look at that income, you can look at on that income statement, you can look on the balance sheet for assets and liabilities. But if I were a creditor, potential creditor, investor, potential investor, I'd like to know come on in. I'm sorry, I'm going to write this. Yeah, gateway financial yeah. accounting review. Alright. What what I'm what I'm saying under statement of cash flow is that it tells the creditor, existing or investor, you know, existing or potential. What did the com what is the company doing with its cash? And are they, you know, are is the cash going up? Is there cash going down? And what are the reasons for it? Go ahead. So when you say changing cash from one year to the next, is that from any time one year to the next or the calendar year? Well, I'm assuming that? annual financial statements, but you could obviously prepare financial statements for a period of time shorter than a year. So that was 
But we report on things that are material. We can aggregate data if there's a lot of small data, small amounts and just call it prepaid assets instead of prepaid insurance, prepaid rent, prepaid taxes. And we can aggregate the data because individually these amounts are not material. You can have a lot of expense accounts, aggregate them, call them miscellaneous expense. They're not material to show all the details. Companies keep track of all the details, but for presentation purposes, we want to report on the material amounts and aggregate the smaller amounts rather than show all the assets. So it's a miscellaneous type account? Uh, well, miscellaneous. Um, accounts. Pardon me? It, yeah, it depends. To what extent are you going to report to the shareholders? All this detail that's on the trial balance and all the accounts, we aggregate some of it. It's not material to show all these little balances. We can sh aggregate some of it. So materiality. Uh, materiality actually means, I'll tell you, we're capable of making a difference in the mind of the reader. Okay, if you think that it's going to influence the reader, the creditor, the investor, the reader, the financials, you should show it. If you can aggregate certain amounts because they're not material, that's fine too. So, if I told you, uh, here's another example: the waste paper basket. It's an asset. It's the definition of an asset. I could set it up. It's an asset depreciated over 10 years. Let's say it costs 20 bucks, two dollars a year. Right. Or I could just expense it as office expense. This year, would it make a difference to the readers whether I depreciated it over 10 years, two dollars a year, or just expense it as 20 bucks? Yeah. So it's more relevant. Yeah, capable. Right. I don't think it's going to make a difference to the reader whether we set it up as an asset and depreciate it or expense it immediately. So accounts tend to go, we'll just expense it. It's not material. It doesn't mislead the readers. Even though it's really two dollars a year, we're going to just expense twenty right away. It's not a material asset to the university. It's not a material amount on the financials. We haven't misstated the assets. We haven't misstated the expense. It's just expedient to expense it because it's not material. But we do want to show material amounts on the financials. Go ahead. Do you have a constraint? Um, that's where I am. Oh. The materiality. Yeah. Now, what's material to you isn't necessarily material to me. You know, I pick up pennies on the sidewalk and you walk right by. But when I was a kid, pennies were material. You know, and you want to bend over a quarter, but I need the exercise in the way, so I'll just pick up anything. Okay? Uh, so, uh, conservatism, that's another constraint. Do you think that it's better to overstate your assets or understate your assets? If you're trying to be honest. Right, right, right. Be conservative. If you've got obsolete inventory, don't carry it on the books if it, you don't think you have a customer for it and you can't really sell it. Even though it's inventory, it has no value, so we're going to write it down. It's conservative to understate your assets. I didn't say misstate, I just said understate. You know, uh, Be conservative. How about liabilities? If you have a, let's say a, a product with a warranty that you are selling to customers, should you show your warranty liability or not? Yes, yes, it's better to overstate your liabilities than understate them. If you're, oh, I think I went too fast. Wait, uh, you're involved. You, okay, go ahead. Did you say understate assets? No, you want to. You want. It's better to understate your assets. Be conservative rather than overstate them. So you should understate assets yes. and overstate liabilities. Yes, but I don't mean misstate. I mean just be realistic. Right. Right? Let's say you're a pharmaceutical manufacturer uh, and uh, you're having lost, there are lawsuits being filed because your product you know, is causing people health problems. Should you report the liability or not? Well, you could put it in a footnote down at the bottom, but if you can quantify it and it's probable your attorney says you know you're going to have to pay out some money, then we probably should put the liability on the balance sheet. It's conservative to put it on the balance sheet. Just like warranties. If you know you're probably going to have to honor the warranties and pay out some money, establish a warranty liability. Record some warranty expense in your, that you sold the product because along with selling it, you also have a liability. Okay. Go ahead. Well, management's objectives are, yeah, we want to show as much as we can in assets. Right, but the problem is management's going to show receivables that aren't collectible. 
because they want to sort of pump up the balance sheet. They're going to show inventory, which they can't sell as an asset. And I'm saying, in accounting, we, we should be a more conservative, right, and show things realistically. And given the opportunity, two choices, to overstate or understate your assets, it's better to understate them than to overstate them. And on liabilities, it's better, it's more conservative to what? Overstate your liabilities than understate them. Otherwise, you're misleading the readers. Like a checking account, and you have $1,000, and then you want to just pretend you have $800 in there, right? So you don't Well, yeah, if that's the way you work. <laughs> yeah, given two alternatives, pick the least favorable outcome. Okay, if you could overstate your assets or understate them, be realistic. Don't show inventory you can't sell. Uh, don't show receivables you can't collect. Because then you're sort of misleading the readers. I think, I think she meant you're not sure how much is in the <laughs> Well, then you should be sure to understand. Think you have less than more. Uh, another thing we do is we, and I don't know if it's a constraint, but we try to match the concept. We try to match assets with liabilities. We match revenue with expense. We're really big into matching. If you're going to show all your assets, show your liabilities. If you're going to report sales, report all your expenses during the period relating to those sales. And don't record 13 months of rent expense in a 12-month period. And then the next period, show only 11 months of rent in a 12-month period. Because you're, you know, there should be 12 months of rent in every period. Match the sales of the period with all related expenses. Cost of goods sold, the rent, utilities. I mean, don't record 10 months of utilities in a 12-month period just because you didn't get the bill. You could estimate what the, if you haven't received the bill, you could estimate what the uh, remaining expense would be based on prior bills and prior experience, right? And record some expense, even if it's only an estimate, right? And you still have a liability to the GWP for, you know, those two months of uh, utility expense for which you haven't got the bill, but you know you're going to owe the money. Show the assets, show the liabilities, match revenue with expense. In this day and age, a lot of companies, what they do is they want to show a lot of revenue and a little expense. That's not good matching. And then you, you've read in the press a lot of restatements, right, where companies say, oh, our revenue was too high, our expenses were too low, because they sort of got caught or turned themselves in. Isn't it getting cold? Yeah, it is. Okay. Remember, two days ago, it was too hot. It's too cold. All right, consistency. Consistency in applying GAAP. In applying GAAP. You know what GAAP is? Yeah. That place to shop, right? Yeah. You know many accepted accounting principles. So if you're using something called straight line depreciation, maybe you remember that? You don't switch like in year three and start using something called double declining balance. If you're using, uh, you have inventory, you're using something called FIPO, remember that? Yeah. Right, you don't switch and use LIPO, that's not consistent. You have to be consistent in applying GAAP from period to period. So the people reading the financial statements can measure the results, right, and look at the financial position from one period to the next. My analogy is imagine if they changed the rules of the game from one team to the next team, playing in a different ballpark. You wouldn't be able to compare the results. Right? So there's specific constraints and rules and the way they measure home runs, right? And so they can report the results consistently from team to team and within a league. Right? That's everyone's only, a pot user. Everyone's playing under the same rules. Go ahead. That's only in a single period. Once you can switch, just not in a short period of time. Well, if you're going to switch from year to year, okay, then you have to disclose to the readers in a footnote that you switched from FIFO to LIFO and the impact of the switch. Most people don't like to calculate the impact of the switch, so if they pick a method, they'll stick with it. Is it too much well, it's extra work to calculate, plus you have to disclose. So we're going to be consistent in our application of uh, you know, accounting for uh, receivables, accounting for inventory, depreciation methods, revenue recognition, consistency. You know, Just as an example, when is a sale a sale? Typically, it's when you ship goods, bill, uh, provide a service. Uh, that, that, by the way, is a, is a real big issue in accounting. When is revenue earned? Typically, it's when you no, no longer control the goods or provide a service. But it all depends you know, on situations. Go ahead. Is that true in the same uh, accruals? 
No. Uh, I'll tell you, in accrual accounting, we try to match revenue with expense. Do you understand the difference between cash and accrual accounting? Um, Are you we forgot? Accrual accounting, we recognize it whether or not cash is received, but when, when it happens. Right, when the sales or the service is provided. You want an easy uh, chart? I've got one. She gave me a great marker. It's too much of a Here's a group. Here's cash. Here's when do we recognize revenue? And when do we recognize new marker? The old one's right out. So I recognize, recognize expense. Okay. Under the accrual concept, we recognize revenue when it's earned. Like you said, when we ship the goods, provide the service, even if we don't get the cash. Pay under the cash, basis of accounting. We recognize a couple of your basis of accounting. That's a good question. We recognize revenue when received. Cool cash basis is very rare now. Uh, small when we receive cash. Uh, small businesses and individuals tend to use the cash basis. Uh, medium and large size companies use accrual accounting. And in terms of expense under accrual, you recognize expenses when incurred. Doesn't mean you paid for it. Right? But if you ship goods, you have a sale, you have cost of goods sold, you have freight expense, you have salary expense, you have rent. Doesn't mean you paid for everything, but we're going to try to record all of the expenses related to that sale. Under the cash basis, we only recognize expense when dollars are paid. So most of you being individuals, not corporations, right, use the cash basis, right? Even if you earned it, but you haven't received it, you don't feel like you want to report it to the IRS, right? But your boss says, you know, you earned a bonus. If you didn't get it by December 31st, right, you don't want it on your W-2, right? Uh, your cash basis, and you report to the IRS cash basis. But cash basis is not GAAP because revenue would only be reported when dollars are received and dollars paid out. It's sort of poor matching of effort with rewards of effort. Under the accrual basis, when we earned it, we reported a sales. When we incurred the expense, you know, related to that sale, it, it provides superior matching on the income statement. Cash versus accrual. Another thing they said we talked to you about was we're, we're contra accounts. It seems a lot of students forgot about or didn't learn about contra accounts. Probably learned it and forgot it. Right? So an uh, example of a contra account is the allowance for doubtful accounts. On the balance sheet, and I've got some key accounts here. Allowance for doubtful accounts or allowance for bad debts. Or allowance for uncollectibles. It's all the same. Uh, assets typically work, you know, plus minus in terms of debits and credits. Do you remember T accounts? Mm -hmm. Okay, a contra account works just the opposite of a related asset or liability. I'll come up with another example for you. So it has a balance contrary to what you might think it would be. So on a T account, it's minus plus. So we have asset, uh, $1,000 of receivables. We think 300 aren't going to be collectible. So our net receivables are 700. Does everyone see this as a contra account? Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. What is the net receivables? I just said it. It's right up there. Can you look at these two? $700. OK, fine. Now, let's write off a specific account using the allowance method, which is GAAP. Right? I'm going to use T accounts in the interest of time. We identify an account of the uncollectible. Let's say it's a $50 balance from a customer. They call us up, they go, we're not going to pay, we can't pay, we've been trying for nine months, we can't get it from them. Right? We're going to take the receivable off the books. There's a decrease in the receivable. That's the write-off. Okay? There's the credit. We need a debit. Some people might say bad debt expense. 
but no, we use the accrual basis of account and we set up a provision for doubtful accounts. We're going to use it up, part of that provision. It's like a reserve or cushion. Remember we expected 700? So basically what you do is, here in general entry form, you debit the allowance for doubtful accounts for 50. You credit uh, accounts receivable for 50, and this is to record to write off off a specific customer account. Can you credit the other side? It's a contract. It's a uh, the credit is here. That means right side. <coughs> okay. This was debit. That's left side. So we are going to have to credit receivables. You with me? Right. And this works. You're right. The contract accounts work opposite. That's to, to write off a specific account. So here's something that's pretty important. What is the balance now in each of these accounts? Well, you sum down the positive side, the negative side, you get a balance. You sum down the positive side, which in this case is the right side, and subtract the negative side, 250. And I use a check mark to indicate balance. What is the net, what are the net accounts receivable at this point? No, what's the net of the two? No. 700. Right. The point is, is that when you set up the allowance to begin with and they net to 700, when you deduct $50 from this side and $50 from that number, right, and then net the two, you're still at 700. Yeah, we're going to go through that here. So what, what, what just changed here? This is now 950. This is 250. And we're still back at 700. The point is that it's a tricky question. What is the impact of writing off as a receivable on net assets or net receivables? What is the impact if you write off a receivable on net assets or net, re net receivables? Zero. It was 700 before, and it's 700 after. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. What is the impact of writing off an account receivable on, let's say, net accounts receivable? Or on total assets? Doesn't matter. It was 700 before, and it's 700 after. Go ahead. What was 700 before? The net account? The net. The net amount. 1,000 minus 300 and 950 minus Oh, because 50. the 300 is being written on for a, 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 a for a, okay. Yeah, I lowered it 50. I lowered because this 50. Yeah. You lowered it 50 because 50 was collected? No, because I wrote, I, I, I got the receivable. Here's the printout of the invoice. I put on it not collectible, right? I had $1,000 receivable, but 50 isn't collectible. So I deducted $50 from the receivables. Right? And at the same time, I used this provision for doubtful accounts and deducted 50 from it. Mm -hmm. It was established previously to consider the possibility of a receivable. It was only an estimate, but now I'm using it. I'm oh. using up a portion of this provision or allowance or cushion for potential bad debts. And then that 50 collectible written up was taken out from the 200. Those. Yeah, because yeah. you need a debit, you need a credit. Mm -hmm. If you look at what the 300 is, what is the 300? Is it, they, put an, they put an account it's that's, a that's set up for, for, for potential bad debt. Right. Right. right, right. Because what we want to do on the balance sheet is show the receivables not at the gross amount, but at what we call their, the net amount, which is net realizable value, what we think we can collect. So. What this does here is consider the fact that not all receivables may be collectible. And then whatever the balance is, like 250, goes to the next cycle, right? It is a balance sheet account. Yes, if the balance is still there, it doesn't get closed out at the end of the account period. I didn't show you how the provision or allowance is set up. I just showed you how to use it. And in particular, what is the impact of writing out the receivable? On the net amount, the answer is zero. Right? It doesn't affect net receivables because it's still 700. Go ahead. But that just assumes that you do have 
a contra, uh, you have a balance in that. That just assumes that you do have it, correct? That's a good point. I mean, if you don't have it, theoretically, if you didn't have it, then there would be an impact on the net. Would well, there, or would there not be? Yeah. Well, here's what happens at the end of every period, if you remember. We look at our receivables and determine we set up an under gap uh, uh, potential or provision for gap accounts. So you're right, the first, at the beginning of the first year, we don't have it, but from then on out, we do. Okay. Right? And it's only an estimate of what we think is uncollectible. If we knew exactly what's it, what wasn't collectible, we never would have sold to the people in the first place. Right? So the provision's going to move up and down, okay, depending on, you know, how close the actual is to estimate. This is an estimate. This is actual an actual write-off of a specific account. Well, I only have like 20 minutes here. There's another important thing I wanted to talk about. How many of you are like following me home tonight? <laughs> Oh, you mean I'm getting dinner now? <laughs> what time are we meeting at Chili's? <laughs> no, but if you have questions, you want to get them resolved. If you don't, if you don't have your old accounting book, you know, go to the library. Maybe sitting there on the shelf collecting dust. No one's checked it out in four years. Because that's the book that you're most familiar with, right? When you learn the material and forgot it. Versus trying to read from another book. Uh, I wanted to talk about the time value of money. Oh, before I do that, one more thing about contract accounts. Then I'll do that. Okay? Another example of a contract account. Someone already mentioned it. Right, fixed assets. You have, let's say, a building. And this is at cost. Plus, C-O-S-T, and it's $3,300. We have a contract account that's called accumulated depreciation. And it has a $1,000 in it. And we show the building, it's called book value, by definition. The historical cost minus the accumulated depreciation would be $2,300. Since this contra account thing can be a problem for people. So here's building, $3,300. Here's the accumulated depreciation account. It works contra, so it's got a balance opposite of the related asset. Do you people remember how to record depreciation expense? <laughs> I'll give you the number. I'm going to tell you it's another thousand bucks. What, what's the journal entry to record depreci depreciation expense and right. accumulated depreciation expense? Depreciation expense and accumulated depreciation on the building. And if I'm going to post it into the account, I'm going to debit depreciation expense. Here's another key account for a thousand. I'm going to call that A as a reference, and this is another thousand, and that goes into the contra account. So let's just look at the book value here, before and after I made the adjusting entry. The historical cost of the asset less the accumulated depreciation was 3300 minus 1000 is 2300 historical cost minus accumulated depreciation equals book value and after i made the adjustment 3300 minus what's the total accumulated depreciation 1000 <coughs> Why do we use a contra account here? We want to keep track of what the building originally cost. Why do we use a contra account here? We want to keep track of what the receivables, the gross amount was. That's another example of a contra account. 
after asset. This is a contra asset, that's a contra asset. Accumulated depreciation. Accumulated depreciation.
this factor here would be a different factor than that factor there. I can use some examples. The next situation deals with a series of payments. This would be the future amount of an annuity. An annuity is a series of payments equally spaced over time. Suppose, for example, someone said, I'll give you $100 over the next four years, and you decide to put it in the bank. First payment starts at the end of year one, you put it in the bank. The second payment, end of year two, you put it in the bank. Third payment, you get it, you put it in the bank. Fourth payment, you just put it in the bank. Which ones are in interest? Well, this one earns interest. This one earns interest. This one that you got at the end of year three earned interest, and the 100 you just got, you just add, put it in the bank, it earns no interest. Here's sort of what the picture looks like. Again, you've got to know the number. In this case, that equals the number of payments. And the interest is the interest per period. So how much will you have at the minimum? $400. Yeah, will you earn some interest on this one? I said yes. This one, yes. That one, you might have like, let's say, $415, $420. From what I can tell where students are having problems is that they can't distinguish between a lump sum problem and an annuity problem. The key is annuity always is a series of payments. Right? OK. Do you know the difference between the present and the future? So if you take the problem apart and try to diagram it, even if you don't have a lot of time, chances are you'll be essentially figure out which type of problem it is and pick the appropriate factor. And they only give you like three or four factors. They don't give you tables. Here's the opposite situation. This is the present value from the problem. Present value of an annuity. Your rich uncle says, look, I'll give you $100 for the next four years or an equivalent amount today. What is that equivalent amount? Actually, it's something less than $400. He says, I don't have the tables here. But he says, look, I'll give you $350 today or $100 over the next four years. Some people say, well, give me the $350 right now. That may not be rational. It depends on interest rates. It depends on how many time periods are involved. The problems aren't that complicated. But if you draw the picture, you'd be much better at solving the problem. I've gone all but sort of quickly because I want to leave time for some questions. But what do you think? Can you solve these type of problems? If you can't, go back and try to solve them. Draw the picture. You have to give us the formula. You don't need a math formula. They'll give you some factors. They'll give you factors for the future amount. You know, at a certain interest rate and at a certain end, the future value, they'll say the future value factor is this. The I is this. The N is that. Or they'll give you the present value factor. If it's an annuity problem, you want to use an annuity factor. Are they talking about a present value annuity or a future value annuity? Once you draw the picture, you can pretty much pick the factors you're supposed to use, the I and the N. And, you know, just multiply times. In this case, it would be, oh, let me give you the formula here. It's the periodic payments. They call them the rents times the factor N and I. Equals, this is the present value of that annuity. So in this case, it would be $100 as the periodic payment times the factor, which, you know, they'll give you that particular amount. So that one would be called the present value factor, annuity factor? Present value annuity factor. In this particular case here, the future value is equal to the periodic payment. Right? I'm just going to put the rents, not rents, times the factor N and I. So in this case, it would be 100 times the appropriate factor. The future value of the annuity. Thank you. Thank you.
value of an annuity factor, you multiply the 100 times the factor, and you get what the total is supposed to be here. This is sort of explained in 10 minutes, I discovered. Okay. But there were a lot of things I didn't calculate. No. You don't need, you won't need that. And we probably shouldn't. As Ron said, you just have to recognize the right factor. Mm -hmm. right. Because you might know what this one is? No, the factor. Yeah, can you do a math right? That has to be applied to a cash flow, right? Now, what Ron is, the exams are not asking you to do that. These exams will basically give you the factor at this interest rate for 10 periods. The present value is this, or the future value is this. The students were having difficulty was recognizing whether it was a single sum or whether it was an annuity. So which factor to use? So you don't have to calculate if interest rate is 10% and this is five years, what's the present value factor? Yeah. That yeah, will be given to you in that table. Yeah. What, but what will be given to you is four factors. You may give you the present value of a single sum at 10% five years, like in this example that Ron did, a four year example. They will give you the present value of a single sum received four years from now, let's say at 10%. They will also give you the present value of a four period annuity at 10%. They'll also give you the future value of a single sum four years at 10%. And they'll also give you the future value of an annuity, a four period annuity at 10%. Now, he asked you, if you have this, what's the present value? So all you have to recognize is, A, this is a series of payments, hence it's an annuity. So to scratch out the two single sum formulas. Then you have to say, am I being asked for the value here, or am I being asked for the value at the terminal point? If it's today, that's a present value factor. If it's terminal, it's the future value factor. That's why we don't have to worry about financial calculators or whatever. Just worry about, can I recognize which is the right present or future value factor. Can you, can you tell me? So the present value then, if he's just giving us a movie, then it would just be a hundred? No, they're going to ask you for they're going to ask you for this question mark. Are they asking you about what will an annuity grow to, or what what is the present value of an annuity? An annuity. You're going to pick one of four factors. You can see that if, if they give you lump sum factors, you don't want those, right? Because we're dealing with annuity, right? As Professor Ansari said, some students don't recognize an annuity when it's staring them in the face. It's a series of things, right? Right. So they probably, you know, then it, conversely is whether you ask, well, what will this amount grow to? They're picking an annuity factor when they shouldn't be because it's not an annuity, it's a single lump sum. So you've got a one in four chance of picking the right factor that's already given. Yeah, if you have a dollar at 10%, right? Two years from now, it will become a dollar twenty-one. Now, if you are and, and by the way, if you take 1 over 1.21, that is the present value of something that is being received two years from now. So it depends on the question. Now, both factors are there, 1.21 as well as 1, 1 over 1.21. I can't do that in my head. But I, can, <laughs> yeah, I can tell you if you have a calculator and you take 1.21, the inverse of 1.21, that's your present value of a single sum. Now, the question is, if we are we asking you, so if both, both factors are available, 1.21 as well as 1 over 1.21, correct? You with me? Now, is the question asking you, you are going to receive $100 today, what is it worth two years from now? Or is the question saying, you are receiving $100 two years from now, and what is it worth today? That's all. Now, if it is today, you apply 1 over 1.21. If it is two years from now, you are applying 1.21. Yeah, but he raises so, a good question. Though, so what do you mean by a factor? That's the present. That, I thought you said oh, no, 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 no. The, fact, the factor that. is... And um, I say, uh, do you remember the tables in the book? In your yeah. book, it talks about compound interest. Here's an example of a table. It has factors that you can use. It's already computed, for instance, at 4% two years from now. You multiply the amount that you receive today. 4% two years from now, you look up the factor, you multiply the amount today by that factor in that table. Have no, you're not going to have tables. He's going to make it even simpler for you. You're going to have, they're going to give you the amounts from four different tables. You just have to pick the right factor. Oh, okay. Yeah. The right factor. And 
In other words, you have to be able to distinguish what type of problem it is here. Are we talking annuities, lump sums? Are we talking future amount? What will it grow to? Or we've got an amount in the future. What is its present value today? So it's just going to be one of these numbers in the table. That's right. So how do you how do you know which table is coming from? I'll tell you which table is coming from. Do you see the heading on that table? Yeah, 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 that heading will be there. Oh, okay. So you don't have to worry about it. All right, see, now it's a little more clear. But okay. Before, I'm sure. You don't have the question in front of you, so it's harder to envision that. Someone that you just stated about the door and that, but with the annuities, can you just like, do the same thing with the annuities? Yeah, it's the same thing if you look at, that is also a table of annuities. At the okay. Annuity fact. And what it will tell you is, that tables will tell you if you have a four period annuity. Mm -hmm. And let's say the interest rate is, you know, 10%. You go down the four-year, 10% column, and it will say this present value of this annuity is this. Now, there's also another table that is same thing, four years, 10%, and it's the future value. It tells you what the future value is. Now, we will give you those tables. We'll give you those two cells, 10% future value of 10% uh, of a four-period annuity, present value of a four-period annuity at 10%. We will give you that. But the only thing you have to figure out is the particular problem asking me to use the future value factor, or is it asking me to use the present value factor? And that's where the one suggestion of, of diagramming is very helpful. If you diagram this, you can decide whether the question is, what is it worth here, present terms, or what is it worth in some future terms? We need to tell the between an annuity and a lump sum, which is looking to see if there are periods of pain. Exactly. That's all it is. And we, as you recall, that is the definition of an annuity. It's a series of payments. Just and they're looking up on the table. Yes, yes it is. Yes, it is. So now well, I'll have to ask you why is it that 60% of the students got it wrong? I can tell you why. That's the question, right? I have a sample quiz. There are right. no examples in the sample quiz. I yeah. did the whole thing. Oh, okay, fine. And so I think it would really help for us to have a sample. That's true, but you see what, what happened is, no, what happened is that you're probably, probably, I think what we just, we asked you is that. And, and the reason we found out, this is why we are reviewing this with you, is apparently some students and in some classes, for some reason, have been taught only to rely on a financial calculator. So they can punch the right button, so 10% of 4, and they can get the answer. Mm -hmm. But we didn't give them the financial calculator, you gave them the answers. So it threw them off. I've never seen this. I'm used to taking this problem and punching the numbers of my calculator. What is this? And it, so somebody didn't teach them, but what they were doing was what that table is about, that the calculator is giving them the same thing that's in the table. So the table is on the test. So the table is on the test. Could you give us a sample question? I don't know how to use that. I think Ron just gave you a sample Like this? No, but I mean, exactly as it, as it is uh, worded in the, on the test. Yeah. He did give you. You know, Shireen, I think we need to just put the four factors on this problem here. Yeah, just put the four factors on this problem. Okay. Shireen, yeah. yeah. I'm just going to look them up for Yeah, just look them up. Okay. So, at 4%, 4 percent. 4 percent. And four years, right? And yeah. Four years. That's the, that's the time period that's being prescribed. Okay. The future value of a lump sum. Future value, single. Could you make it 10 years? Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's 4% 10 years is 1.48024. Okay, so this is 1.4882. Right, okay. Present value of a single. 4% 10 periods is 0 0.67556. 0 0.6755. Right. Future value of an annuity. 4% 10 periods, 12.006. And present value of the of an annuity. 8.11. 4% 10 periods? Yeah. Yeah. 8.11. 4% 10 periods. 4. You okay. say 4 OC oh, here, I got yeah, 4% 10, 10 periods. periods. So okay, so now the question is no. A question might say the following. One possibility is you have a lease which requires a four-year lease where you can use a ten-year ten ten a ten-year sorry ten-year lease which requires a uh, hundred dollars uh, per uh, you know a thousand dollars payment per year. What is the 
amount that you would, uh, the, what is the present amount for that lease if you wanted to give them one lump sum? At 4%. At 4%. Right. Here's the picture. Right. No, no, the question is, what is the, what uh, you would like to pay them a single lump sum today instead of paying them rents every year, what is that amount? Now, are, are we asking future value or present value? If you're asking present value, let's then get rid of this one and this one right away, correct? There are those factors now. Is it a single sum or is it a series of payments? Well, then there's your factor, 8.11, that's it. So you don't have any interest. That's it. That's what we're trying to say. It's not complicated, it's pretty simple. The factors are given to you. This is what you will have on the question, and here's a sample question that I did. So that would be the answer. Times the thousand dollars. Yeah. Times the thousand dollars. Don't forget that. Times the thousand dollars in rent. Don't forget that. There's your answer. Whatever the amount. That factor and that rent. Thousand dollars times. My example was a thousand dollars, right? So thousand dollars times that factor is an answer, and that's what your multiple choice is going to be. They'll be what actually if you can guess what the multiple choices will look like. They'll look like 8.11 times a thousand, 12.11 times a thousand, and six times a thousand, and because then, then you can pretty well guess what the multiple choices will be. And none of the above. Just to just to be wait, wait. <laughs> yeah, we have some fun too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. You want to pay in one, one payment. Yes. Uh, the 10-year lease uh, requires a $1,000 payment per year. Right. What, no, what is the, what is, if I, then, then the second part of the question was, if I want to make a single payment now, now as opposed to 1000 a year, what is the amount that I should pay? And it's not going to be 10000 because 1000 times 10 is 10000 right? It would be something less than that, and the factors are given to you. So if you multiply 1,000 times 8, you can see that the number is $8,110, and that's the right answer. That's a, and that would be one of the choices you would see. Another choice you might see is 120000 That's you get your of the That's right. That's, that's what it will be. Why couldn't you just calculate it? What do you mean? Come up with the same answer. Like, I don't understand if you have the present value of the period down the bottom there. That's if that were, no, I know it's a separate example. But if that were an interest rate of 10% and it was for four years, why couldn't you calculate it as 100 over 1.04, 100 or plus 100 over 1.04 squared? You can. And keep doing you it. Can. You get the same answer. Sure. So you don't have to even have to look at the table. That's up to you. That's another way. Yeah, that's a good point. The table is just an accumulated for fact. helping you to save you time. You notice how long it will take you to do four calculations? Fine. You can do it. It's not a problem. It's just that it takes a little more time for it. Nobody wants to do that. <laughs> No, but that's actually it's if you feel well if you if you feel comfortable doing it the way you're doing it, that's fine too. No, nobody says that this is the only way to do it. You know? Ron, I think you're going to come back and do it a one hour presentation on how some interest with computations, I'll do it. Thank you, Ron.